Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're happy to put this session together, something we're calling reserving beds, uh, setting the table for when it's time to plant. Uh, my name is Ryan Marr and I work as a research and, and extension specialist in the Cornell Small Farms Program. Uh, my focus is in vegetable production, soil health and reduced tillage. I'm joined here with my counterpart, uh, in, at the University of Maine, Peyton Janakis, uh, where together we are been actively doing research on tarping practices uh, and supporting farmers throughout the Northeast in trialing, adopting, and testing practices to, that fit to their farm. So this workshop or this webinar fits into our, our long-term goals of, of helping you uh, trial and implement TARPs in ways that work for you. And there's really no better way to do that, I think, than bring in other farmers to share their experience. So that, that has inspired this series of workshops, uh, the first of which starts um, is today and will follow the next uh, two weeks. And I'm hopeful that you have registered for those as well. Uh, we're grateful to have two farmer speakers today. Uh, Rachel Cross from Spirit of Walloon Market Garden in Boyne City, Michigan, and Molly Comstock from Colfax Farm in Alford, Massachusetts. Uh, we have about an hour today split between both of our speakers and time to take your questions and as much discussion as possible. Um, but before I turn it over to them, I just wanted to go over a couple logistics. So I need to, uh, one, I have, uh, I've emphasized this. We're gonna have a good group today, so I wanna make sure that we all stay muted and we don't interrupt the speakers uh, while, they're, while they're sharing. Uh, two, we want to hear from you as much as possible through the chat. So please um, direct yourself to the chat box, throw your questions in there, and we will get to as many as we can. We will not, we will field them after both talks. Okay, so we'll, we'll basically collect all these and we'll, we'll save them and hold them and bring them in in the, um, the last 20 minutes of, of the webinar. And yes, we are recording. Uh, we are going to post this on the Small Farms YouTube channel so you can find it there. Um, I can't tell when it will be there, but that there will be a home for it. So I, I look forward to, to um, sharing it with both you and, and wider audience um, after, after the series is over. And lastly, uh, this, this is really a continuation of work and part of a larger, uh, a larger set of projects all supported through grant funds. Um, and so we acknowledge uh, Northeast SARE, who's, who's funding workshops and webinars as well as some of our uh, on-farm and research station uh, research practices where we're testing practice side by side to learn about the science of tarping. So we also acknowledge USDA and Hatchmith Lever grant funds and the Northeast IPM Center, uh, which is involved in a Northeast collaboration of all those folks that are working on tarping in order to try to support regional collaboration. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker and I will stop sharing my screen. And I will let Rachel take the reins and, and introduce yourself and get rolling. And please do use that chat we will monitor it closely to throw your questions out there for us. Hey everyone, my name is Rachel Cross and I am the owner and manager of Spirit of Walloon Market Garden. And we're in Boyne City, Michigan, so we're the, the Midwest group in this set of presenters. Um, but on our farm, we, we use tarps for quite a few purposes, but just to get you acquainted with the way our farm is, so we're a pretty small farm. We're farming about on like an acre and a half. When you actually like look at our bed space in production, it's about 0.8 acres. 
we have one heated transplant greenhouse and four hoop houses. We're non-certified organic, but we do follow all the practices. And we're a vegetable and flower farm mostly, but we also do some fruit and some herbs. So I like this picture of, from last year because I feel like it's pretty indicative of the way our farm is. We have uh, tomatoes in this house, we have rosemary, we have figs, and we have lisianthus. So that's kind of how things look around here. We're just doing a diverse range of crops on a pretty small scale. And this upcoming year, 2021, will be our seventh season. So I'm mostly gonna focus on how we use tarps in our succession plantings today, but I also wanted to kind of touch on a couple other of the ways we use tarps on the farm first. Um, we use tarps for three main reasons. Uh, one of these reasons is for, as a, one of the tools in anaerobic soil disinfestation. So for this process, we're using a carbon source and prepping a bed thoroughly and then using a lot of water to bring it to almost like saturation conditions, that's pretty hard for our sandy soils. And then putting a tarp over it, burying the edges to intentionally create anaerobic soil conditions that help kill off some soil pathogens. Well, we're especially using this in our hoop houses to manage root knot nematode. And there's, this is a big process. I'm not really gonna get into it much today, but I did wanna touch on it because I feel like it's another interesting use for the tarps you might already have on your farm. And if you're really interested in this, uh, we will have an article about this process in the upcoming spring issue of the Cut Flower Quarterly, so you can look for it there. Uh, we're also using tarps pretty frequently to manage weeds in our beet and carrot plantings. So we found that tarping with beets and carrots works really well with like a three week tarping period and then following that up with seeding and then flame weeding after seeding. So our process is five days after sowing beet seeds and then seven days after sowing carrot. We're then going back through with the flame leader and just going right over that seeded bed. And I really like this picture because you can see all of these beds had been tarped and then flamed. I'm tarping carrots in this bed here. The beds on either side were beet that have already been flamed. But you can see, even though they were tarped, you can see the weeds in the paths. So using the tarps in conjunction with a flame weeder is a really nice way to kind of get those weeds that might not germinate under the tarp. And on our farm, we have had a really bad problem with crabgrass over the years. We're finally getting to a point where it's under control, but we found that crabgrass doesn't seem to germinate under the tarps for us. So using it in conjunction, using the tarps in conjunction with a flame weeder seems to really help take care of our crabgrass problem. So what we're focusing mainly on today is using tarps to manage our salad successions. So this is an aerial view of the farm here. And you can see along this fence edge, we have a long skinny black tarp and then three beds that are already put into salads. So last year we used a really large tarp, 24 feet wide by 100 feet long to manage six beds of salad. So for this process, the first thing we're doing is just like doing any other tarping where we're prepping our beds completely like with all the minerals we need based on our soil tests and any sources of nitrogen we plan on using. And then we irrigate really well before we tarp. Like not to saturation, but so it's a nice moist bed to really encourage those weed seeds to pop. And then we're prepping with a Kuhn power harrow. We really liked this tool. It, it's not, it's a nice, really easy to work bed, especially for direct seeding, but it doesn't seem to be as detrimental to the organic matter as a tiller is. Like the power harrow, instead of like working like this to work uh, air into the soil, it's kind of like has two beater attachments that are spinning. So you don't have as much inversion and you're not burning up as much organic matter. So since we started using this, we went from like 1.6% organic matter on our field, which is really sandy here, to around 3%. So we've been really happy with using this tool. So our next step after prepping totally, irrigating well, is then we tarp. 
And we found that we have like the best success with the tarps if we're waiting at least three weeks. Like sometimes we try to push it just with two, but we're finding that we still have a lot of weeds coming up then. So three weeks is what we recommend. And the way we manage the tarps, as you kind of see in the corner here, we're weighing down mostly with sandbags that are actually filled with rocks. We have plenty of rocks on the farm, as you can see. And then we're also using where we're irrigating. We just lay down the set directly on top of the tarps, and that also seems to help keep them in place. And like in this instance here, we've already had these two salad beds tarped and then planted. And then this bed that's covered in the corner here, that will be the next salad bed to be tarped. And we found that because we use netting on all of our salad here, because this is mostly brassica mix and arugula, and we have really bad flea beetles on the farm, we are just using these sandbags to both then cover the edges of the tarp and the netting. So the next step after that three week tarping period is we are planting one bed each week. And with that excess tarp, we're just folding it back accordion style onto the next bed and then just moving the sandbags to hold it in place. So yeah, as you can see here, this will be the next tarped bed. It's folded back onto the beds in front of it. And then we're going through planting, covering with netting. So when we're planting the last bed in the group, the tarp is folded and then just brought back to the beginning. So like in the instance of those beds, this is the three of six. And each week we were planting one bed, folding the tarp back, planting one bed, folding the tarp back until we came all the way back to the beginning. And this was like full grown salad beds that I wish I had had pictures of, but I really didn't have as many pictures of this. So then we're re-prepping those beds by first mowing with a, a flail mower. We, if we have enough room to get in the, the, on top of the bed with the flail mower and the tractor, we'll use that. But if we don't have enough room because the bed next to it doesn't need to be mowed yet, we'll just use like a DR style push weed whip. And that seems to be really effective in mowing down salad crops. Uh, we'll then add nutrients. We add a molasses product that I'll talk on a little bit more later and any additional feather meal applications for the next round of salad mix. And then we do a second working with the power harrow because we're doing all direct seeded salad in these beds. But I feel like if you were working with like Salanova, you might not need to do this. You might be able to get away just with adding the new mowing, adding nutrients and retarping. But I'm not really sure because we focus on this mostly for direct seeded crops. And then we retarp, same process as before, irrigating, putting the tarp back on and folding over. So what we have found that works really well for us is that a nine week period between the first time a salad bed is seeded and the second time a salad bed is seeded seems to be like the ideal amount of time. So when we're scheduling salads for the year, we'll have like a set of six blocks last year that was our first chunk of salad. We ended up having three other beds over here that were tarped as salad beds. And then once we had gotten through that set of nine, we were back to our original bed. So we found like that's what really works well for like having the crop in, being able to harvest it, being able to mow it, prep it, retarp it. That seems to be like the sweet spot for us. We've also had really good success with kind of speeding up that decomposition after mowing by adding a molasses product. So we use, um, it's Midwest BioEggs LCBF TerraFed. And we're using that at a rate of like three ounces per bed when we do that second prepping. And it's, it's like, it's molasses and it's a really easy to digest form of carbon. So we find that that really seems to like stimulate the soil biology to work on decomposing the other things, especially when we're sure to get everything nice and moist. And even, we even use the flame weeder with sometimes with the salad beds too. Uh, just because it seems like, especially if we're trying to rush it ever with like a two week tarping rather than a three week tarping, 
Sometimes we'll peel back the tarp and we can see all those tiny weeds coming up in that little white thread stage. And we don't really want to have to like go over and harrow it again or even hoe it because we don't want to disturb any of the weed seeds that might be down further in the soil layer. So we really like using the, the flame weeder after tarping if we do see any little weeds popping up in that white thread stage. Great. I went through that kind of fast because I was worried we were going to be short on time, but if anyone has any additional questions that we don't get to today in the question section, uh, you can contact me at spiritofwalloon at gmail.com. But I'm thinking now that I got through it in less than 20 minutes, we'll still have a lot of time for questions at the end. You did well, Rachel. Okay. It will uh, we'll definitely open up more space for questions and discussion at the end. So Good. And if, the, if there's things that you would have liked to add, uh, think about those while Molly is talking. Okay. Um, pieces that um, you, you may have uh, glossed over in, in the interest of time, we can revisit. So let's, um, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, yeah, thank you. Rachel, for starting us off. I'm going to turn it over to Molly Comstock now. And Molly, I'm going to invite you to share your screen and get your slides loaded up. All righty. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Let me just interrupt you one second. Sorry. There were some questions in the chat. Um, folks can find the chat down at the bottom of their, uh, of their screen. Uh, please use that. Anything that comes to mind for both Rachel or Molly, and we'll, we'll go through it all uh, after Molly's done. So with that, it's all you. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I don't know what kind of weather everyone else is having, but I'm sitting in a frigid milk house to bring you this little talk. Um, thank you, Ryan and Peyton and Rachel. Um, there might be a few things that I uh, repeat that Rachel said, um, but anyway, my name is Molly Comstock. Um, my farm is Colfax Farm. I'm in Western Mass, Alford, just outside Great Barrington. Um, we are a Oh, sorry, everybody. I'm going to have a tiny bit of technical difficulty. Okay, there we go. A little COVID picture for you. Okay, so I'm on an old uh, dairy farm. We're just under three acres. We're a diversified veggie CSA farm. Um, mostly vegetables, some flowers, some raspberries, uh, herbs. And what you're looking at there is the freshly mowed hay field and then my spot down in there. And <laughs> when Ryan and I were talking uh, prior to this presentation and I was telling him about the tarps, he's like, how many tarps are you using? And um, from this picture, um, I think I should change my, the name of my farm from Colfax Farm to put a tarp on it farm. Um, so anyway, uh, we mainly use tarps uh, as, as bed prep. So we are, um, using organic practices, we are not certified and we are really um, trying to, as quickly as we can, reduce tillage to almost no till. And we're getting there. Um, we're in our third season on this property. I've been farming for the last 10, but we have really reduced the amount of um, heavy machinery and tillage that's happening here. So, um, we use the tarps for, as you can see here, for planting directly into. We also use them um, as a tillage tool. We use them to hold beds for when we're um, not quite ready to plant them, um, but we wanna prevent weeds from growing. And then what else do we use it for? I guess that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, so this is a spot, a comparison spot. So this is, where we um, got in there with a, a regular rototiller behind the tractor. And then right next door to it over here is where it was only uh, a tarp. And then all that beautiful fine green stuff that you can see is the uh, sedge that came back up even though the tarp had been on it for all winter and most of the spring. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Also greenhouse. So we have uh, one greenhouse that we use for our summer crops and for plant propagation. And then we have 
three hoop houses out in the field. Um, so we use a tarp um, to plant our tomatoes into, then we pull that back. And in the spring, we do bed prep and um, get a round of salad greens in there before we transplant um, our summer tomatoes and cucumbers in there. So this is just some shots of our bed prep. So we are, um, we're using a lot of manpower and hand tools in our uh, quest to, to not use fossil fuels and, and large machinery. So there's, uh, when we're done with our bed prep, you know, it's just broad forking. We add our amendments and compost. I use the tilther, um, but as you can see, there's a million tiny rocks in there and the tilther hates that. Um, and I also use um, another small form of tillage that just does like the top two inches. Um, it's actually one of those old fashioned mantis machines. I don't know if you ever saw like a uh, infomercial for those, they're pretty funny, but they're, if you see one at a yard sale, grab it. Cause it works in your amendments really nice and in the, into the top of your soil without doing any um, intense deep tillage. Okay. Um, just some fun shots of worms. I think these workshops are so funny because it's just a lot of pictures of dirt. Um, so we use the tarps um, at, for three week periods, uh, like Rachel was mentioning. Just get, get out of this worm stuff here. Um, I, I included those because every single time we pick up the tarp, the worm activity is like astounding. Um, and I think they are they are our main source of tillage now that we're um, really focusing on tarps. So this is um, a section that had a tarp on it. Uh, we pulled it off. Um, we did some bed prep. Like you see there though, there are still weeds that wanna come up in the paths. Um, we are still working on our technique of dealing with that. We're still doing a lot of stirrup hoeing for the weeds. Um, I haven't, we've been using the flame weeder a little bit, but it's um, the timing on certain stuff. It doesn't always work out. Um, so I'm just gonna sidestep here for a minute and talk about some logistics with the tarps, because as you can see here, there's a concrete block here and some tires and a piece of wood and sandbags and um, a myriad of other things that we use to try and keep them in place. So we use um, 100 foot long pieces that are 12 feet wide to cover three beds at a time. Um, we use the really long ground staples, the eight inch ones. Um, and we really try and get the edge uh, tucked under something, whether it's dirt or a piece of wood or really stapled in sandbag. Cause once the wind gets under it, we're in this big long valley and the wind is really intense. Um, so it is, I'm just gonna acknowledge that the keeping of the tarp, keeping it in its position can be a struggle and that we are using a myriad of things to, to, um, to keep them in place. I would say that we have abandoned the tires and the concrete box, obviously, because that's a pain in the neck. Um, and we are mostly using the lawn staples and the sandbags to relatively good effect, except for March, <laughs> where right now out there, they're, you know, some of them are not where I was hoping they would be. Um, and then because they're permeable, um, we can maintain a really nice moisture level in the soil and they're not a bear to deal with. I can fold one up by myself and move it. Um, that is an advantage to a permeable tarp versus like, I don't know how many of you might be using silage tarps or um, it just, it makes for an easier product to move around. Um, so Alyssa and I, who you can see at the far end of this picture, we, we stand on either end, we fold it into thirds, and then we both go to the far end and we fold it. Um, it's called ticking. If you make beds a lot and fold your blanket like that, so it's when you can pull the blanket straight back out. We find that that's the easiest way to deal with it. So we fold in thirds and we tick it on top of each other until it's in a pile. You can usually pick up that pile by yourself. Um, or it's easier with another person. And then um, we carry it to the next spot it's gotta go. And then all you have to do is pull it out. Okay. So this is a picture of a spot that had um, ryegrass. Um, so 
I included this picture because I think it's really interesting how there was just the tiniest bit of air got in under this tarp. And so it didn't quite kill off uh, the ryegrass there. Um, I just, we've, we've been struggling with, um, this is, I don't think that this is a, here we go. Um, so here um, is where we're struggling with uh, sedge. Sedge is the biggest weed um, that we can't seem to combat with the tarps. Um, it seems to love it under that dark, wet <laughs> tarp. Um, so we are still learning, like I, we tried last year where um, we lay the tarp out, we take it off. Um, once the sedge is, has come out, we either try and uh, flame weed it or kick it back with the hoe a little bit and then put the tarp back down. But those are all still um, in the experimental stage. Um, so yeah, it's a bummer when you pull up a tarp and it looks like that. <laughs> so I'm just, uh, I'm a fan of showing how uh, the challenges of farming, so. Okay, so this is a section where um, we've had the tarp for well, it'll be going on three seasons tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, uh, this year. But if you can see in the pathways, that's little, that sedge just kept coming back. This was in its, this was in its first year. So we rototill traditional, like a traditional rototilling tillage in there and then uh, planted. And then I bet you, we went back in there with the hole maybe seven times to keep trying to get that sedge down. Um, we have a, another section of the field. Um, yeah, this is this Luna. Yeah, where we, we've had the um, we've been using the tarps for almost three seasons now, and this last summer, I mean, you could go in there with a the hole maybe twice and have the weeds taken care of, and that's um, we've been using a tarp in there for three seasons now. So we're we're getting ahead of the weed seed bank that. Um, that's down in there. So typically we, um, we use the tarps um, every, every three weeks. Uh, three weeks is a good window. So if we're done cutting a salad bed, we'll put the tarp on it. Um, we usually can manage to tarp all three beds uh, at the same time with proper planning. But every once in a while you can only do like one is ready to be covered and the other two aren't. But the versatility of the 12 by 100 foot permeable tarp, it's pretty easy to manage that and just get it right into the one section where you want it and then you can unfold it later. Um, every once in a while, I will cut down the crop before we put the tarp on. Um, something If it's something big like broccoli plants or something like that. Um, but more often than not, we, uh, we use the mantra, put a tarp on it, and we just, we'll lay it right down on old salad, old arugula, just, you know, unless it's got a really, a lot of organic matter and a really big thick stem, we'll just put the tarp right on it. And we find, you know, from late May through September that the three week window, it, that stuff is mostly gone by the time that we take the tarp off. And then if there is a little bit of debris left, it's much easier to deal with and we can rake it out um, as opposed to, you know, putting in all the time of clearing that bed prior to um, putting the tarp on. Okay. This is some beautiful rye that we, um, we just stepped on basically. We put the tarp on it and we just kind of tromped on it and then weighed it down. And then uh, when we peeled back the tarp, I think that was a little more than three weeks. I think that was more like five. Um, it had broken down beautifully. And then we went, we measured out our beds, we brought for it, raked, um, added our amendments. Um, and so, yeah, that hasn't been touched with conventional tillage now since then. Yeah, that's what they look like. Look at those beauties. So this is that section I was talking about that's been tarped for three years that um, just every time we go in there, it's just such a joy to work in there. I feel like I'm working in somebody's show garden. Um, <laughs> so 
I would in this in these beds we don't always broad fork. Sometimes the the soil is still just in such a nice condition that will you know for instance in these two beds right now I think that's spinach in there and um, you know once that crop is done we'll just we will put a tarp back on it to kill back whatever debris and weeds are in there um, and then you know three weeks later we'll pull that off and this is often this is often what we're looking at like when we I mean obviously this is after bed prep but when we pull back the tarp often it's just like gorgeous dark soil everything has decomposed and we can get right in there um, and the more that we use it the easier the beds get to be the easier they are to, to work in. Boy, I really like those beds, huh, everybody? I just got a million pictures of that. <laughs> All right, here's some nice views of just the tarp town that we live in. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on, so if you can see right here, so this is where um, we had, I think it was beets. Um, and then we put a tarp on that just to kind of hold that space until we were ready for it in the fall. Um, so that's just an, another, another use of the, the tarps here on our farm. Okay, now these are our experiment in um, doing absolutely no tillage at all to bring the hay field into production. So, um, we had a spot where we laid out three tarps. So that would be 12 to 36 feet by 100 feet. Um, and here's the hay field. And this is where we uh, laid out the tarps. So we laid those, um, let's see, let me get to that spot here. Sorry, these are sort of superfluous. Some rye stuff. I'm gonna go back right here. Um, so we laid these tarps down on uh, 2019 in the fall and we left them there for one year. Um, and then you can see here on the left that that's what the tarps did and then also <laughs> the varmints. Um, so we raked that out um, and then we, we just broadcast uh, rye seed right onto that um, this last fall. And so that what we're hoping to do is um, let that fall, that rye grow up, we're going to mow it down and have it be a, a mulch laying right there. And then we're hoping to plant our fall brassicas into it um, this coming fall. But it's been really, uh, this is like my new favorite spot, spot of the field because watching, just pulling that tarp back and seeing what's going on under there and then seeing the rye grow and then knowing that like, not anything has like gone into that soil just is really exciting to me. So I'm, I'm Looking forward to seeing how those fall brassicas do. Yeah, so that's just kind of the raking we were doing to just even it out and get some of the debris out. But yeah, that's what a year of tarps did to like just a, a 20 year old, more than 20 year old hayfield. And then this was where we planted our garlic this fall. So this um, was tarped all season. Um, we did uh, we did plow and rototill this. This was a new spot that we had to get in this season because our um, CSA skyrocketed last spring due to the pandemic. So we really had to hustle to get some more space um, open. And there's one of my volunteers mermaiding as we like to call it. So it's a, I know Ryan, you wanted 20 minutes for questions and I just have a few minutes left. So. A couple minutes, yep, yeah, and then we'll get to go. Okay. Um, I will just scan on back here. So um, we did tarp, just one last um, example here. We, we tarped this spot for our fall carrots um, so we left that on. Um, that tarp was probably there three weeks. I apologize. No, it was much more than that. The previous season, it looked like this. It was where our tomatoes were. Um, after the tomatoes were done, that's right. 
I'm sorry, I have a terrible memory. Um, we tarped this tomato section and then left it until uh, we needed to plant the fall carrots. So quite a long time. Um, but then when we pulled back these tarps, we could just pull out that black plastic I planted the tomatoes in like, like no problem. Um, Cause all of the, all of the plant matter had uh, decomposed. So it was super easy to pull all that stuff out and then prep the beds for um, our fall carrots. The gallon soga was pretty there. So um, the only other last thing I'll say about um, some of the, the challenges of the tarps is that we, you know, we are providing some really nice habitat for uh, voles and moles and mice. So, um, and we are dealing with that problem right now. They ate a lot of the spinach that we had hoped to overwinter. Um, and they do like to eat the tops of some of those carrots. It's getting to a breaking point. And so it's, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know the best solution to it besides more dogs. Um, so the combination of the varmints and, uh, and keeping them in place, uh, those are the two challenges uh, for us right now. At the moment, it's worth the challenge, especially the them blowing up is, it's really annoying when you put something and then you have to keep putting it down. Um, but during the summer, to just like be able to put a tarp on something, know that it's gonna be right there and ready for when I want it for planting. Um, it's really great. And to, to not be walking behind a rototiller, to not be getting in the tractor. I mean, we haven't bought the, brought the tractor inside the field um, for two seasons now. It helps us move compost around the edges to get it to the beds when we need it. But um, we've really, um, completely taken it out of the field, which feels really good to me to get rid of that compaction and um, to stop using those um, ways of tillage just feels, it feels really good. All right. I think that's what I have to say. <laughs> thank you, Molly. Molly. Yep, thank you. You draw a lot of ideas there and uh, I think we'll have a rich discussion now so can you can probably keep your video on I think now and maybe I could invite Rachel to do the same and Peyton's here too um, I'm not going to have everyone else turn their video on uh, in the interest of our connection um, but we want to go through and field some of these questions and uh, that that we've been tracking through the chat and we'll see where we go with it um, Peyton did you want to yeah start? I think a question that I was really happy that came up because we didn't really preface this, these talks with anything about what tarping is, um, was about the difference between tarps, silage tarps, landscape fabrics, and plastic mulch. Um, and you know, why do you use certain ones, the durability of those, the lifespan of those? I guess Rachel and Molly, do you have any inputs on that? Yeah, so on our farm, for what I talked about with tarping, we're mostly using like the five mil white black silage tarp. Like that's what we're using, but we're also using the landscape fabric too for planting into. So we have landscape fabric that's like pre-marked with pre-burned holes for a few different spacings on things. And we'll like put that down with staples like Molly talked about and then plant mm -hmm. into that. Um, and I, a couple of people have, I have seen some questions or comments about lifespan. Mm -hmm. uh, most things on our farm for both the tarps and the landscape fabric are anywhere from like almost seven years old now to like two years old. And we're still using everything and it doesn't seem like anything's going to need to be retired anytime soon. And I know some other growers who are using landscape fabric like year after year, the pre-burned holes that they say they've had for like 20 seasons. So it definitely seems to have a really long life. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear, 20 seasons. Um, yeah, we use, we use solely the permeable um, tarps. Now I call them tarp, but I, it seems like Rachel that you're thinking of them as landscape fabric, is that? Just for what our purpose is. Yeah, that. sure, sure. Um, I get mine from either Nolts or Rainflow because um, they're pretty cheap. They're only 150 bucks for 12 foot by 300 foot. Um, and I've just found 
uh, that I, I never got a silage tarp because any farm I visited or, or saw that in use, I was like, there's just no way, first of all, by myself. And now even though I have a crew, um, I just didn't want to deal with that. I didn't see that its benefits um, equaled it, the struggles with dealing with it. So we just use the permeable tarps. And yeah, they say that they're supposed to last at least 10 years, but it'd be great if they lasted longer. I think it just depends on if they have a lot of traffic on them. Which, if you're using them in your beds and you're not walking on them, hopefully they last a while. Molly, can you say again where you get the permeable ones? I get them from Nolts or Rainpro has them too. Molly, for your long duration, you talked about putting it on for a year and basically having it on for the growing season. Was that with um, that was was with landscape fabric and holding it down with with staples mm -hmm. and everything else that you have on the farm? <laughs> or do you, were you able to? Keep I literally farm? used like old waterers that they used to be on the stanchions in the barn. I like was using those. To make it down. <laughs> what a mess out there. Um, no, I just I stapled it like every six inches and then lots of tarps too, and it actually it stayed put. Um, mm. If you really overdo it it stays, hopefully. I mean, I really, it just depends on where you are. It's so windy here. Um, but yeah, we did use the permeable, the permeable one on that spot. Um, let's see, there are a lot of other questions too about basically vermin. Are you having a lot of full mole mouse problems? Um, do you find that a certain kind of tarp is more conducive to that versus another? Why don't you speak to that, Rachel? What do you think? <laughs> we definitely have seen voles and mice under both kinds of tarps, both the like woven and the silage tarp. Mm -hmm. But like, honestly, what has really helped us with controlling that is just having cats. Like we have two cats and that they really take care of it for us. Like we don't very often see crop damage. Like sometimes I'll see voles under the tarp and I'll see tracks after taking the tarps off. But I also see the cats waiting at the edges of the tarps and the fabric to catch voles all the time. Like I had that happen yesterday in one of the hoop houses, our cat caught a vole from under some landscape fabric. So, mm -hmm. so definitely, I know that, that can be hard with people who are doing gap certification, but if you aren't doing that, like highly recommend cats. Yeah, I, it doesn't seem like it matters what kind of tarp. Um, I see somebody's asking there about um, when you store them. You know, I try throughout the season, if we fold it, if we fold it up at the end of the bed, there'll be one or two underneath it, but I don't find that they like to eat that stuff and make nests out of it like they would like if you left a ball of row cover out there. Um, we try to bring them in the barn when we're not using them. Um, but yeah, I mean, anything that's making a dark secret little space, I mean, they're gonna be in there. I don't know how you get around it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cats and dogs, I guess. Molly, Rachel, you talked to are, oh, sorry, Rachel, are you also storing yours um, generally inside or you leave them in the field and just kind of rotate around or just to follow up on Molly's I, In the workhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we either, we always have like one set corner where it gets labeled with the tarp size and Sharpie. So when we fold them up, we make sure that corner is always in the same place every time. And we also, and some people have mentioned this about moving them around. Sometimes the bigger ones will fold them in half and then roll them up like on a big cardboard tube, like Rime comes on or greenhouse plastic. And mm -hmm. that has made it really easy to move around because then just two people can like, one person either end can pick it up to move it. And we can sometimes we'll put like two tools that have handles in the ground and then run a piece of conduit between the two mm -hmm. and use that kind of as a reel to unroll the tarp onto a new bed, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we can just pull it out if it's on a tube. That's how I get my drip drip line out. It's yeah, that's, that's how we got the idea. It's like, oh, we do this for drip. We should try yeah, yeah. stuff. So. I what we what's ideal is that you know if our field is like here's here's one section and then there's another one behind if we can fold up that tarp and let it wait here and then all we need to do is pull it out and drag it to the next one 
we're rarely actually storing the tarp. We're usually taking it right off of something and putting mm -hmm. it right on something else. That's ideal. That if you don't have to waste any labor folding it up, that you're just, it's constant, the tarp is constantly working. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I aim for. So in terms of logistics, about how early are you guys starting, are you laying out tarps in the field relative to your last frost was one of the questions that we had. We do it as soon as possible, as soon as like we can prep a bed mm -hmm. or we tarp it. Um, which like some, like usually we start planting out in the field around like week 18 here. It's like like zone five. Um, so usually by like week 15, we're wanting to start putting out the tarps. That doesn't happen every year because sometimes week 15, there's still a foot of snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. But usually we shoot for like three weeks before our first planting date, which that would be like eight weeks before our last frost date. I try to get my, the spot that I want to do my earliest planting, I try to get that tarped in the fall. So you let it sit over the winter? Yeah, I try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, right now we, we do have like our onion beds tarped through the winter, yeah. but I still need to fix that tarp now that the snow has melted. Yeah. It's going around, so. yeah. Um, yeah, I try to get, you know, also because of the wind and soil erosion and stuff, I try to get as much covered with tarps out there as I can. Mm -hmm. Because I figure if by some miracle they all stay there through the month of the month of windy March, then I'll be like, so set because they'll just be there and those beds will be waiting for me when I want them. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say, yeah, I try to tarp the spots I want ready for the spring in the fall. Sounds like you both are aiming for um, at least three weeks of tarping, at least in over the growing season. Are you finding any benefit to leaving it on longer than that? If, if that's something that you do, leave it on longer? If we have like a lot of cover, cause we'll use it over cover crop spaces too after mowing, mm -hmm. and a lot of cover crop or really tall cover crop, leaving it on longer is definitely helpful. But mostly in the growing season, we're just shooting for that like three week period. Cause a lot of times we're like double planting beds. So we're kind of trying to move things along as quickly as we can. Yeah, I mean, it just depends. Like if there's a lot of, um plant matter there that I want to break down. Sometimes it is nice if I have a few more weeks to leave it on there to really have it totally gone. Um, but there, I don't know if there's a benefit beyond that. Yeah. I've been For trying weeds. to figure that out the week, with the weeds because mm -hmm. sometimes I'm like, all right, I'll just leave it on there, but it doesn't matter. I'll pull it off and the sedge will still want to come up. The timing it doesn't seem to matter if it's on there long enough. Now, I don't know if I was using a silage tarp, if that might be different because then there would be absolutely no moisture getting in there. I think that's what the sedge is liking is that it's dark and damp. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it'd be worth getting one to do some side-by-side -side tests to see. But as far as weeds, it doesn't seem like time, like more time means Mm -hmm. you know, less weeds. It might take longer for them to show up. The first well, like- Yellow nut sedge, is that what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah. The perennial, and we found the same issue. I mean, with a lot of perennials, they just kind of hang out. Yeah. And, and wait. <laughs> yeah. And you, you guys are using silage tarps. Right. Yeah. Your problem is primarily in the pads though, is that- Correct, and is that, do you think that has to do with you not doing tillage in the paths as well? Like, or do you have better success with the yellow nut sedge in the in the beds where you're doing some of that? You are doing some shallow tillage or some. Yeah. No, I mean it's it's in the beds too. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it's possible, Ryan. It's possible that in the paths, it's not getting as much. Um, attention as it does not hitting it back as much. you're not hitting the paths as much as your beds even though yeah well that one picture though that i said seven times that was that was paths and everything that was wild 
cover crops came up a little bit, I think, with you, Rachel. Um, and then Molly, you were talking about terminating the rye using tarps. Did you, you didn't actually mow it or anything before putting the tarp over it, right? You were just kind of walking on it and spreading the tarp over as you went? Yeah. Actually, how we put the tarp on it and then stomped on the tarp and then that was that. What okay. stage was that rye at? What's the, what's the magic stage? What's yeah, that was one of our questions. What's it called, Ryan, that stage? Your thesis. Yeah, so I mean, you're, but you're maximizing the amount of rye there. Like you're waiting until in your place, like early June or something like that. Yeah, that exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then that rye that, well, the rye that's out there now, I'm not going to tarp that. I don't think I'm just going to mow it down so that I can plant into it. Um, but the other stuff, yeah, I just stomped and then put a tarp on and then, yeah, pulled it off. And it was as broken down as that that picture shows you. Mm -hmm. Peyton, can I follow up on the, um, the hay field? Because I think that question was in there too. Molly, you talked about tarping the whole season and then seeding rye mm -hmm. directly without doing any soil disturbance mm -hmm. after removing the tarp. I mean, and how it looked really nice. Like what was the catch on the rye? Like some talk about it being really compacted after being, especially if it's on new ground, you know? Um, that hasn't been worked at all, you know, or like, was it really, is it really uneven? Like, what do you envision? Um, I imagine you're planning that field for a, a, a certain set of crops next, uh, this year that might um, be easier to get into or be less sensitive to that rough, those rougher, potentially. Yeah, rougher. I'm, cer I'm certainly not. Gonna, yeah, I'm going to transplant the fall brassicas in there. Um, mm -hmm. It did not seem compacted to me. It was not wildly uneven. There was one little trench spot, but that was from something that had been done to it before. So um, I don't know. I'll, we'll have to have another tarp talk. In the I can take some better pictures of stuff. <laughs> the rest of the questions, I think, were more around um, the soil. So soil biology, microbes, um, have you guys noticed anything since using tarps around that? I know, Rachel, you said you're really building your organic matter. Um, seems like everything's decomposing under there from the pictures that you both showed. I feel like we definitely see a lot of worms even under the silage tarps too. Mm -hmm. And then with the, yeah, the decomposition happening, like definitely the microbes are happy, I would say. We're I, I know when we're doing like the ASD that I talked about, the anaerobic part of it, mm -hmm. like in that we're like intentionally killing things off. So like that's definitely doing some interesting things to the soil health. But in that situation, we're like re-inoculating the soil afterwards with compost and compost tea and a little lactobacilli solution from like Korean natural farming. And we've had pretty good success with that, like really nice plant growth afterwards. So I feel like overall, like tarps are definitely supportive of soil health. Yeah, I agree. And it's for us because we're not we're not doing any tillage, so like whatever's happening under there is undisturbed, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, the worm activity is wild. I can't can't believe it. Um, and yeah, our organic matter on our last soil test was really, I can't remember the number right now, but I mean, in general, our soil health is really, is really doing great. Awesome. Molly, have you found re residue problems? Like when you take it off and it just hasn't, hasn't done the job for you? Or are you doing some hand raking too in some ways? Are yeah, you I mean, pulling plants like a really hard you know, deep rooted brassicas and things like that. Well, well the deep root, the brassicas we try to clip just underneath the soil surface because uh, we want to leave all that root mass and biology there. So we try to clip that before we cover. Sometimes I'll look at a bed that's gotten out of hand with a weeds or a crop and, and I'll say, put a tarp on it. And, uh, and then we'll come back and it will be mostly dead. But what's so nice about dealing with the residue after that is it's like even if it's not gone it's like so much easier easier to manage and get out like it takes 10 minutes of raking and two buckets versus like 
two hours of some real labor. Um, yeah, it's rare that I take it off and I'm like, it didn't work. <laughs> that, that doesn't really happen. Just a time check here, Peyton. We have a, mm -hmm. just a couple minutes left. So I don't know if there are some other themes through the questions that you picked up. I'm, I'm trying to go through them as well. There's just a couple of miscellaneous ones. There was a question um, for Molly, knowing what you know now, is that how you would establish a new field again in the future using the tarp like you did? Um, I guess it would depend, you know? I mean, sometimes you gotta get in there and get to work. Like if you have time and space, I would say definitely, but um, mm -hmm. I would say for sure, like prior to this, I was doing just two, two acres and a lot of tractor, a lot with the tractor and the rototiller. And um, I am, I wish someone had told me about tarps sooner because um, they're really, they're a really incredible tool on our farm. That's like, it's making our farm look like I always wanted it to look. Um, and that is a, that's a really satisfying feeling to like look up there and know that like we're taking good care of the soil and we're winning against the weeds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not true at all, but some days it feels like kind of. <laughs> yeah, I would highly recommend implementing them in some way in your practices if you can. Also, I, I, did, I didn't have a PowerPoint thing with my email, but if anybody wants to email me uh, Ryan or Peyton, if you want to share my email, that's probably fine with me. Yeah, definitely. We will um, we will have a follow up email, direct folks to the the recording, and 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 also to uh, contact you, you both with specific questions. Um, is there anything um, anything else you wanted to add, Rachel, before we sign off? I guess the only thing that I didn't really talk about, I pulled those slides, is sometimes we're using the silage tarps in conjunction with the landscape fabric with the pre-burned holes. Because sometimes we'll have like a bed that has the fabric down at a particular spacing that will end up holding like five successions of basil. So we'll like prep the whole bed for the basil, put that landscape fabric down, and then put the tarp on top of it. And that's really helped us with any little weeds that come up through those holes in the burned landscape fabric. I know a lot of people who have gotten away from using landscape fabric with holes because they're having too much of a problem with like little weeds coming up. Mm -hmm. And you have to, instead of being, you can't use a hoe, you have to go through and hand weed all of it. So that's really helped us address that issue on our farm. Awesome. Great, Th thank you. I, I really appreciate Rachel and Molly coming in and sharing your experiences. When I start talking with folks about tarping and you two in particular, I just, it's just kind of blown away how different you can use a kind of a simple piece of plastic or, or woven fabric. So uh, two very different, uh, two different operations, different farms finding, finding uh, the tool to be really useful. So we're gonna continue um, these discussions over the next two weeks. I did put the link, if you didn't register for those, uh, please do um, uh, take a look and, and register for the next two. We'll be meeting uh, same time uh, in a week, a week from now on the 23rd and then again on the 30th. Uh, I also put in a link to an evaluation. I'm gonna put it in here again in case it got buried. Um, we want your feedback on what you uh, got out of this TARP talk, what you'd like to see in future TARP talks. Uh, if you want to share, about your farm, we want you to put it there. So please follow that link. And I hope everyone has found this really, uh, really helpful and useful as you think about going into this season. Thank you very much, Rachel and Molly. I applaud you um, for taking the time right now. And with that, I, I think we will sign off and, and hope everyone has a great day.